The theme is quite simple. It's that lots of tiny little interactions often contribute to extraordinary moments. I grew up in a small town in India, so it wasn't. It was very atypical for someone growing up in uh, in a town in India to say I'm going to be an engineer. But it wasn't atypical to say I'm interested in science. You know, I think okay. my my mother was a mathematician, my father is a is a chemist, and you know, so they both kind of encouraged me to be always curious about science. Uh, when I was a kid, it was sort of like this fascination with space and how things worked, and somehow that got me interested into engineering. But engineering was a bit hard, because engineering was seen as a very male, it still is a very <laughs> male-dominated field, especially like hardcore engineering, right? So I uh, wanted to come to the, to the US to do a um, graduate degree, so I applied to different schools I got admission from Stanford and, and Cornell, but Cornell gave me a fellowship. Had you visited Ithaca no, before? No, no, I had no idea where Ithaca was. Uh, had no idea how so cold it would be. So was that first winter had the been a And I came in the fall semester, and fall in Ithaca is so gorgeous, right? Yeah. I thought, oh my gosh, this is paradise, and then winter came, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I had never seen snow before. It was really, oh, really? Oh, really wow. pretty traumatic. <laughs> So I was doing my PhD at Cornell, and again, serendipity. Um, it's sort of like I had a, my best friend was also a PhD candidate. Uh, she was finishing up her thesis. I was just starting up my PhD, and we were leaving the lab one day, and she said, oh, you know what, I'm going to the career fair. Then she said, why don't you just like, come with me, we'll walk that way, and then go back to grab some lunch or something. So I went with her, and I filled out an application, and randomly, totally randomly applied to a few companies, and I got an interview call from Motorola which at the time was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, mm. um, to come for a campus, uh, for a on-site interview. Um, so I thought, okay, free trip to Arizona. They're gonna give me a free hotel room and a rented car. I can go see the Grand Canyon. This will be a great vacation. I literally left a snowstorm. I landed, and back then Phoenix was a tiny airport. This was in mid eight, late 80s, I guess. Um, they had baggage claim outside under the palm trees. And oh, I fell wow. in. I was like, I don't care what job I get here. I don't <laughs> care how much they pay me, I'm going to move here. <laughs> and I got a job offer with Motorola, and that's how I started my career. I actually kept telling my professor, I'm going to come back and finish my thesis and get my PhD, and never went back. <laughs> I started as an engineer in semiconductors at Motorola, kind of worked my way up, became the chief technology officer for Motorola Semiconductor, then became chief technology officer for the whole company. In the middle, I ran a business. I moved from technology to really learning what it takes to run a business, and sort of that's where I cut my teeth on operations, and I joined uh, Cisco in 2008, so I've been there about five years. Part of what I do at Cisco is run uh, strategy and technology. And as a CTO, my job is not to know all the answers. My job is to ask the right questions. I mean, I've been in the industry now over two decades. I think what we are going through now as a, in the technology space, the amount of change and uh, the pace of change is the fastest I have seen in the last two decades. I think, it, so given that, I think it's going to be impossible to feel like you would know all the answers. So I think at some point you have to say, I've had enough input, now I'm going to uh, you know, look at what I need to do to set a direction. We are, by the way, I think especially in the IT tech industry, outputs are now more important than inputs, right? That is definitely a shift that's happening. So intuition and our having the ability to say, I've got enough data, I'm going to not over-rotate on the analysis, but make a call is going to be, and I think a leadership behavior that will be needed more in the future. So the way I work is to say, okay, what will IT look like five years from now or 10 years from now? Uh, and obviously, the farther if you go into the future, the less clear it is. But you may you may have a better idea what it might look like five years from now, and then work backwards from there. You know, if that's how people are going to consume solutions in IT five years from now, what do we have today that'll help us get there? Where are our gaps? And when we do acquisitions, we try to do this. It's like a huge chess game. It's it's fascinating. I love what I'm doing. <laughs> 
I think first and foremost, what matters is domain expertise. I think you have to be recognized as an expert at something. I mean, each of us have to have a you know, platform that we are known for, right? You know, I am known for being, identifying disruptions early, figuring out how to maneuver huge companies to get to that. When an opportunity comes, I'm not afraid to take it. And I recently started talking about how you have to disrupt yourself in order to pursue different opportunities, yeah. right? I think especially for women, I think women usually hesitate when there's an opportunity presented. We, I, I was talking to a group of women engineers at, uh, at Cisco recently, um, we're saying we always come up with 10 reasons why we're not qualified for that job, uh, whereas typically men would find 10 reasons why they are qualified <laughs> uh, for that job. And I was encouraging all of this, this person, you know, we were giving her a director position and she was saying, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to take that and it might mean more hours. And there's also this notion that somehow a bigger job, bigger title means more, you have to work more hours. That's not true. I mean, there's only so many hours in a day, right? At some point, if you're CEO, doesn't mean you run out of hours if you linearly extrapolate, <laughs> yeah. and that can be the way people work. But somehow, I think there's this mentality, especially for women, that they think if I'm going from a manager to senior manager to director, I have to work more hours. Um, and we have to change that mindset as well. You get more responsibility, clearly accountable for more things. But it doesn't mean I ha can work any more hours than people that work for me. There's only so many hours we all work. We all can work. How challenging, I, and I've heard you speak a little bit about this, um, was sort of integrating motherhood. Yeah. Was that something that took you by surprise? It did take me yeah. by surprise, because at the time I was running a factory. I had responsibility for 7 by 24 coverage in the factory. I had a direct labor workforce that was reporting to me pretty large work working team. Um, and I was able to control everything, and my son changed everything. I totally lost control of everything. He's now <laughs> 20, so obviously, you know, somehow managed through that. And what I found the hardest part, and I talk about this to new parents, men and women, um, is, you know, parenting is tough, and it, it continues to be tough. It doesn't become any easier as the kid grows up. When they're real babies, you know, you, you feel guilty about leaving them at any stage. And you know, there's a lot of guilt associated with the decisions that I made at the time that was causing a lot of stress. I found that I was always feeling guilty and I was always miserable. You know, if I came to work and left my baby with a caregiver, I was feeling guilty that I wasn't home and I was being a bad parent and I would work from home and then I would feel guilty that I was missing a big customer uh, meeting and somebody else was getting credit for the work I did. Uh, and then I would, you know, then I would try to do both those, and I was guilty that there were dirty dishes in my sink and my home wasn't, you know, spotless. And then I would try to clean up, and then I would feel guilty I wasn't at the gym working out. Like, <laughs> always, it was always something. And I kind of learned that, you know, that's why I don't like the word balance, because somehow balance means you're taking up 24 hours and dividing it up, and, you know, you're. 12 hours or you, you know, you're going to be this and other 12 hours you're going to be that. Real life isn't like that. And I think uh, uh, what I learned was, I call it integration now. You really have to try to be integrating your work and your, li you know, your family and your community. And to me, this is part of my tech community. You know, I took time out of my busy day to come here because I want to be part of this tech, tech community. And yourself, I think that's what I talked about at Wisdom 2.0. I found that actually the, the thing that gets neglected in all this, you know, you may try to do work and family and maybe you'll do some community when you have free time, but you tend to neglect what drives your creativity, yourself. For me, it's art and poetry. And uh, if, if I don't spend at least a little bit of time in painting or writing poetry, I get really why, you know, wound up and I can't feel, I feel I'm not as effective as a leader and, and in creating. So I do feel you have to integrate all four aspects of that, especially as we're developing technologies that allow us to just over-rotate in one direction, mm -hmm. right? You know, sometimes we measure our effectiveness of getting things done with the pace and speed at which we do things, even simple things like email. Just going through a bunch of emails and replying, we feel really proud when we hit inbox zero, right? 
Oops. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, we do. I, sometimes I just like go through, if I'm traveling, <laughs> I'm on a plane and I land and I look at 500 messages, I'm like, I'm so proud of myself if I reply to all of them before I get to my hotel in the limo. <laughs> and, and somehow we measure ourselves to being really effective. How fast can we do things and how much can we do? versus the quality of my reply. Was it really clear? Did that person really understand what I was saying? And we also pride ourselves, especially in big companies, you, you're considered very important if your responses are really brief, like yes, no. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's all BS actually, right? And I found that uh, when I was trying to reply fast and I was just saying yes, no, yeah, will do, people, I wasn't being the human being that I that could be. People would think of me as this cold corporate CTO thing and then they would meet me and they would say, oh, you're very different. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, on the screen, you're like this big person. In real life, you're really tiny. <laughs> and <laughs> you're actually pretty funny. And uh, your emails are like just so uh, analytical. And I tell them I need this, this, this. I'm making these, these decisions. And I realized it wasn't the personality of who I was as a human being wasn't getting reflected in my leadership because I wasn't using technology the way it was meant to be. So I think meditation helps me bring that humanity back into technology. You know, if you kind of look at the history of the internet and technology in the last, I would say, we, we think of it as four phases, right, in the last 20 years, 30 years maybe. Uh, the first phase of the internet was about connectivity. Really, the internet came about to provide connectivity. Email was the killer app. The next phase of the internet was moving um, business transactions online from physical to virtual or digital. And that gave rise to e-commerce. The third phase is what the last, I would say, maybe five to seven years, where interact social interactions started moving. We think the next phase, which we are beginning to enter now, will be driven by the transition to the Internet of Things, which is machine-to-machine -machine communication. So a lot of sensors that are going to process data will have, someday this building will have sensors. It will adjust the temperature automatically. It will send you messages, and you, you can extend that, right? And we're seeing that already with self-driving cars and Nike's fuel band and Fitbits and these are all machine-to-machine -machine communication. And the broader vision at Cisco we talk about is the internet of everything. You know, So it's sort of like, uh, how do you bring data, process, people, and things together? And how, how can the network enable all of that connectivity? I think human-computer interaction is also going to change. There'll be different ways we'll think about UI. I mean, all this is still so ripe for innovation. One of the things that we strongly believe in, and that's the reason I am here today, is a lot of innovation occurs outside of our boundaries. And I mean, it always occurred at the intersection of disciplines, right? It was always, <coughs> even you know, 10, 20 years ago, uh, it was chip design and manufacturing. That's where innovation occurred. Um, now I think what is happening is it is becoming much more multidisciplinary. And I think that's, that's another thing I talked about at, uh, at Wisdom 2.0, I think. You know, one of the things that's happening is that even product design is now getting combined with art. Like Stanford mm. offers these uh, uh, engineering, uh, uh, design, and art courses combined together, right? One of the things I was talking about, which hasn't yet happened but should happen, is MBA uh, courses will start teaching meditation and being thoughtful. And you know, because today, all we teach in business schools, business leaders are supposed to be looking at spreadsheets and data and make decisions. So that way, I think it is becoming much more multidisciplinary in the future. So it, you, know, you still have to have expertise, but it's the ability to operate at the boundaries is where innovation is already happening and will continue to happen. And we need to encourage our universities to be modifying the curricula and the course to be that way. Mm -hmm.